Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, we're going to talk about the building blocks of deep learning, including fast GPU execution and automatic differentiation, or AutoDiff. These allow us to build powerful deep learning frameworks and many other things as well. And I'm still here too. You just heard from Afueco, who's the co-host for this episode. She's a PhD student at MIT working in robotics and machine learning. She also runs the Fancy Fueco YouTube channel, where she discusses scientific Python, machine learning, grad student life, and more. And as she said, today we're going to talk about building blocks for deep learning. And we're going to focus on Python, Elixir, and DEX languages. For Python, we're going to look at JAX, which Fueco is going to tell us more about. When it comes to the Python programming language, there are many Python frameworks for deep learning. The most common Python deep learning frameworks are PyTorch and TensorFlow, and these allow for the easy access of GPU acceleration for Python deep learning models. I would consider PyTorch and TensorFlow to be heavyweight deep learning frameworks. Sometimes it can be useful to use a more lightweight deep learning framework, such as Scikit-Learn, which provides a NumPy-like interface for deep learning models. However, Scikit-Learn doesn't expose GPU acceleration to the user. This is where a framework like JAX comes in. JAX provides a NumPy-like interface for mathematical computing and deep learning, and it also provides useful features like auto differentiation and provides functions for just-in-time compilation that expose GPU acceleration to the user. It can be really easy to convert a NumPy-based algorithm to JAX, and this can really speed up the most difficult parts of deep learning. So that's how JAX fits in to the Python ecosystem. We'll also talk today about Elixir and NX, where NX is inspired by JAX, and both use the XLA library behind the scenes for JIT compilation to CPU and GPU. We'll also talk about the DEX language, which is built from the ground up for typed functional array processing, including parallel execution and on the GPU and auto diff. The three top contributors to DEX are also contributors to JAX. Other languages we won't cover today include Futhark, where they're also working on auto diff. We also won't cover Tai Chi, which is another language embedded in Python, as well as Julia, Swift, F Sharp, and other languages with auto diff support these days. But looking back at JAX, let's start with a simple example. We'll have a function that just returns x squared. And let's get our imports. JAX exposes a library called JAX NumPy, which is a lot like the NumPy API, but designed for working in JAX. Let's see some of the differences between JAX and ordinary NumPy. First, in NumPy, we can make an array, 0, 1, 2. We can assign b to it, so now a and b are both the same object. If we modify a, a is changed, but so is b, because this didn't return a new object. Instead, it modified the existing one. We can also just change values. However, if we make a jax numpy array and assign it to b, they're both going to be 0, 1, 2, and the same object. But if we say subtract 1 from a, a has changed to negative 1, 0, 1, but b is still 0, 1, 2, because this did return a new object this time. And we absolutely cannot change the contents of our JAX arrays. They are immutable. And this is a difference between imperative and functional programming. In functional programming, you have constant data and pure functions that operate on those data to give you new values. And why does this matter? Well, as Trolls Henriksen, the creator of Futhark, said when I interviewed him, If you want parallelism, you definitely need some kind of control over effects, and purity gives you absolute control because there will be no effects. So, let's look at our example here again of x squared. And let's get numbers from negative 1 to 1, 5 of them. Negative 1, negative 0.5, 0, 0.5, and 1. And let's square each of those with this really exciting function square. So we see the square of negative 1 is 1, negative 0.5 is 0.25, and so on. But now I want to take the derivative of that. Because if I can find a derivative, I can find a minimum or maximum value. And that's how I optimize functions such as neural network learning. If we come over here to this visualizer, we can see the function f of x equals x squared, parabola, with a slope that's a line along any point. At the zero point, the slope is also flat or zero. At 1, the slope is 2, and at negative 1, the slope is negative 2, because the derivative of x squared is 2x, or 2 times x. We can ask JAX for that derivative using the grad or gradient function. But instead of telling us 2 times x, it gives us an opaque function handle. And that's because 
auto diff doesn't do symbolic differentiation. Instead, it creates an opaque function that can calculate the derivative or gradient at any given point. X squared is easy to make a derivative of, but not arbitrary functions like deep neural networks. So I can say, what's the derivative at zero? It's also zero. That's what we expected. And the derivative at one is two, and at negative one is negative two. Note that I can't take the derivative of the entire array at once because it has five outputs, and gradient is only defined for scalar output functions. To work around this, I can take the sum of the squares, and then I can calculate the gradient at multiple points. If you really want a function from arbitrary inputs to arbitrary outputs, look at Jacobians, but we won't cover those today. So seeing that we can do this, let's run our program. And we see our array here of our x values, x squared, and derivative of x squared, having been stacked up right here in our calcgrad function. And knowing that we can calculate derivatives, we can also make an optimized function that given any function, can take the gradient of it, and then walk across a number of steps and modify a starting point in the direction of the gradient, scaled by some kind of rate. So for example, we started on the right-hand side, we'd wanna walk down to the left, and vice versa, if we were on the left, walking to the right. We can turn off our gradient calculation for the demo purposes, and instead take a look at this optimized function. Let's start at x of four and walk downhill. And we see ourselves converging toward x of zero. And it's easy to analytically calculate the minimum of any quadratic equation. But again, for much more complicated functions, walking down a gradient is very helpful. And if this is a function of how bad our choices are, then the minimum is the best choice. Having seen Python, let's take a look at Elixir, which again is a great language for concurrent processing, but like Python, hasn't always had the fastest execution. NX, or numerical Elixir, hopes to improve this situation. Like Jax, can use XLA for GPU optimization. Let's just focus for now, though, on calculating our gradient across a lens space from negative one to one, like before. Calculate our x, our square of x, and the gradient of our square of x, which in this case, we can just pass the square in directly. It apparently assumes by default that input one is only related to output one, and so forth. Let's run this. And we see again our x, our x squared, and our derivative of x squared. Although in this case, I manually implemented lens space, unlike the primitive that was built into Jax and NumPy. None of the technologies we're discussing today are at 1.0, although Jax is the most mature and widely used of them. Meanwhile, here we can also see this example of calculating across many more than five values of x. We can compile either to CPU or GPU behind the scenes. This was also available in Jax. So having seen Jax and NX, let's take a quick look at Dex as well. Like Elixir, Dex is a functional language with immutable values, but it looks more in the style of Haskell, or languages in that vein. Dex is statically typed. It even includes array sizes in the types, although the array sizes can be inferred if you want to. So here if we calculate our gradient, we do the lens space, like before, now built into Dex, and we can calculate our x, our square of x, and our gradient of our sum square of x. And by default, our top level expressions are gonna be output to the console. You can also embed Dex inside of Python and Julia. And while Dex is a functional language, they do have effects for IO, but I won't be demoing that today. And I think it's fun that for the looping operations in Dex, which are a map operation, they can infer the size of the loop. However big X is, this has to be the same. So we just say for I in inferred, two, or x squared for each. Now they also have a built-in square function inside of dex, but I implemented on my own for fun. Anyway, having seen simple x squared example, let's do something more interesting. And that's robot arms, because robots are always the funnest thing. So here I have a viewer of a robot arm, and I have the length of each link in this arm or kinematic chain, from the origin point to the end effector. And I have an angle of each of these joints. If I change the length of the link, this got shorter now. Or if I change the angle, it rotates. And here in our Python implementation, I can make a name tuple that tracks an angle and a length for each link and makes an arm of those. I can even combine an array of angles and an array of lengths into a list of links. 
And then I can do forward kinematics. In other words, calculate where each link reaches out to by summing the angles as I go, then finding the cosine and sine of each, multiply by the length, and add them all up. This gets us to some endpoint, starting at the same angles and the same link lengths as we saw in the web page a second ago. And we reach the endpoint of x 1.2 and y 1.7. 1.2, 1.7. This is our display of what we're seeing here. Then by using gradient optimization, I can move this robot arm to any point I want to. This is called inverse kinematics. There are different ways to go about it, but for today, I'm gonna to use the same optimizer as I used for x squared in my other program that we already saw. Here I say, start at these angles and go for this goal point. And I make a lambda here that only has angles as an input. Then it calculates the distance from where the arm is reaching to the goal point and asks the optimizer to optimize from the initial angles to whatever angles are necessary. Let's try to reach x0, y.5. We get a bunch of steps here. Let's copy and paste these into the viewer. We see our starting point and we see as the optimization progresses, it moves toward the final point that we wanted, 0.5. If we change the learning rate to something higher, we converge faster. And just about reach our goal point. However, if we step too fast, we bounce around some while converging. Or faster yet, and we don't converge at all. So the step rate matters a lot. Now we'll take a look at how the JAX JIT compiler helps us run our code faster. And here, let's get our imports, an array of angles, lengths, and make our arm, which is an array of links. And let's start without the JIT compiler. Let's see how long it takes to run these functions. The initial one that loops over the link objects takes about three milliseconds per run, plus or minus. The second one that zips and loops over these arrays is also taking about three milliseconds. And then our final that has no explicit loops but uses entirely the Jackson P primitives It's currently our fastest, taking less than a millisecond. But what happens if we JIT compile these things and run on our default setup, which here is a GPU? Let's try forward zero again. And now we're finding it take less than 200 microseconds, which is faster than our previous implementation before, just by doing the JIT. And our second implementation, forward one, is now down to 30 microseconds. Our last one, which was previously the fastest, is almost at 30 microseconds as well, but might actually be a little bit slower than our second function here. So we can see how this JIT actually made things run a lot faster by running things on the GPU, or alternatively, CPU, instead of having the Python interpreter run this code. And having seen Python, if we look at Elixir implementations, we'll find similar things we're doing here except we use a reduce loop rather than doing an update operation. We also had to implement our own cumulative sum function for now. Perhaps some of the limitations today will be improved in the future. And in DEX for our optimization loop, we use a state effect to emulate reassignable variables. So here we've seen how we can use gradient optimization to move a robot towards a goal point by optimizing the angles of its joints. We can instead think about optimizing the weights of a neural network to learn how to do things like recognize objects and images. If you're interested in how to use these primitives of GPU acceleration and auto differentiation in Python to build your own deep learning models, check out part two of this video on my channel, Fancy Fuego, where I'll show you just how to do this. Tom will also be there, face included, to talk about the wider ecosystem of languages and libraries.
And while you're there, definitely check out her other videos on Scientific Python, Grad Student Life, and more.